Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 512. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 21st of June, that exciting moment when it's the longest day, which is either wonderful because there's so much light, or, or rather sad because the days are now going to grow shorter. Half glass, half empty, glass, half full, don't be here. Okay, welcome to the program, ladies and gentlemen, clergy, laity alike. I'm glad you enjoy what we do here. We need you to let people know what we do here. Please share the program on your Facebook feed, through email. Please comment on our YouTube channel for each episode. A lot of great comments going on, lots of questions, lots of corrections. It happens. Please like us. We want to have our Sally Field moment every day. And if you could go on Facebook and YouTube and just click the like button, that would be really helpful. If you don't want to watch us, we have a podcast. You can just listen to us in your car. You can even, well, I'm not going to say it out loud, but that one little thing we talked about last week called Alexa. If you want, she can play our podcast by just saying, you know who, play Anglican Unscripted, and she'll do that for you. Okay, gentlemen, a lot to talk about, but first, how's everybody doing? Gavin, how are you doing over there in England? I'm extremely London? excited England, yeah. because I, I've been going blind in my left eye for a while. Hey, Hello. Very miserable. <laughs> and finally, I'm getting a laser, a laser operation on Wednesday, which apparently cuts open the back of the the um, plastic retina. sack that sure, holds yeah. the retina. Well, that holds the, the um, lens and will let some light in and it will make so much difference to me. I've been getting really, uh, I've been getting very sad about not being able to see. It's been horrible. So, so, so thank God. And uh, I hope it works. The only, my only fear is, and I think I'd be glad of people to pray for me, of all the, 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 the terrifying things they say can go wrong. They, they said includes another detached retina. I don't think mine would survive a third detachment. So if people are willing to pray, well, I'd be very grateful. And what is the, the appointment again? It's, it's, it's Wednesday morning, okay. this coming Wednesday at 8.30. George, so how are you we're, doing? We're to pray so that Gavin does not have a Buddhist eye that is totally detached <laughs> right. from all uh, yes. reality. Well, of course. Get, uh, George, how are you doing? Oh, I'm miserable, get Gavin. Uh, you're, you're, you know, mid midlife crisis, I assure you. I'm well, having this, it. This has just been a rotten year. Oh. I mean, come on now. Uh, you know, uh, all all the uh, well, you know, the we had mentioned in this early in the spring that we were going through personal crises, and mm. uh, and there comes a time when you sort of become numb to these things, and then one morning you wake up and the pain is back, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> and you go you go forward but no it uh you know each of us uh, the three of us each have been undergoing uh attacks against uh our persons our psyches our souls and our ministries sometimes the sometimes the attacks are more painful sometimes they're less but uh it's been tough oh it is i mean i i have a clear case of ptdsd p s t d for my all that's happened with my daughter's wedding, my son graduating, going off to college, all these midlife crisis things, uh, everything triggers me now. And uh, so when somebody says they're triggered on Facebook, I know what they mean. I will get over my triggers because tomorrow is another day and that's just life. We've just bored our audience in the first five minutes. Let's move on to some real news. I wrote down some things here. Uh, a lot of people have been following the story of Bishop Love of Albany. And he was going to be persecuted for not allowing a uh, church in his diocese to perform same-sex weddings. And he was brought up on charges or pseudo-charges or Title IV. And somehow the paperwork got lost. I wonder if you could update us on that, George. Metaphorically speaking. Metaphorically speaking. Uh, Bishop Love, uh, in his diocesan uh, address to his convention last Saturday, gave an update on the status of his ecclesiastical law proceedings. Last year, he was suspended uh, in very limited area, meaning he could not discipline clergy who performed same-sex marriages in Albany, 
who, who acted against his uh, counsel, and he filed an appeal. Well, that appeal had to be a answered within 14 days. That appeal of the initial suspension has never been answered because the process has been temporarily suspended. Now, this is, a, and so I don't know whether it's still, they're waiting for a signature, it's somebody's out on maternity leave, as soon as they get back, they'll find it. This is exactly what we all predicted, sure. that they, they're they going to slow walk this. They do not want, as Kevin said in our pre-show meeting, they don't want to make Bishop Love a martyr. Not at all. And at the same time, they don't, and Bishop Curry doesn't want to blow up the, the bridges he's been trying. He's been working very hard to build bridges with the remaining conservatives, while at the same time keeping the crazy le left in uh, at bay. He, he's sort of the Nancy Pelosi of the Episcopal Church. He's got a crazy base, and he knows politically what he can and can't get away with. So well, this is being slow walked, and probably, I don't know if this may speed things up, but I don't think anything's going to happen for a long time. Bishop Love has not only been abandoned by the Episcopal Church, but he's been abandoned by the conservatives that are left in the Episcopal Church, George. Some of the conservatives, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, there's a group, the Communion Partners, who are a group of uh, bishops and some clergy. It's a self-selecting group. They're not representative of anybody but their own opinions. They uh, have not really fought the good fight for Bishop Love. They sort of, they've not been against him, but they've not been leading a, a vocal fight for him. Now, this could be a realization that they don't have the political capital to change things, and therefore they're saving their ammunition for another battle. I'm not going to judge their motives, but we've not seen uh, anybody really mount a campaign within the Episcopal ranks to save uh, Bishop Love that, I've, that I'm aware of. Now, this show has talked about China the hypercapitalism, the persecution of Christians and Muslims in China, probably since episode 10, if you want to go uh, far enough back. And now we're watching the politics of Hong Kong in China. And it, it's something to watch from a religious standpoint as well, because the Anglican Church is involved. And when the Anglican Church is involved, there's likely to be a flip-flop. George, what's the latest on our uh, Archbishop of Hong Kong flip-flop? Archbishop Paul Kwong, who is also the elected chairman of the Anglican Consultative Council, has been an opponent of the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong for a long time. He has been appointed by the government in Peking, Beijing, to the Chinese People's Political Consultative Council, which is a body of basically wise elders uh, who basically get the rest, get social, uh, social life in line with communist doctrine. Paul Kwong is no friend of the democracy movement. When we, 20, when we had the last round of riots, he chastised them in term. And earlier when we had this latest round of riots over new extradition laws that would allow Peking to seize Hong Kong citizens and take them into the mainland and try them for political crimes. Uh, he basically denounced uh, Ill uh, illegal protests. Well, all protests were illegal. So the way this is worded was he denounced any public opposition uh, to this, to this new proposed law. Well, a million and a half people went into the streets over the past few weeks. And if you read the news accounts, uh, the, the anthem of uh, the political protests are Christian hymns. So this is not a good look for a church leader to be on the opposite side. And so Archbishop uh, Kwong, joined by the two other Hong Kong Anglican bishops, did a reversal. They supported peaceful democratic protests and peaceful uh, attempts to block the will of the government in Peking. So the archbishop, I think, read the tea leaves and realized, uh, or his fellow bishops and church leaders said, look, you have put us on the wrong side of this. Very wrong side, yes. Very wrong side. I don't care. I don't care what the... Let me tell you a little anecdote that is uh, scandalous and unkind and mean, but tell you how the world works. Years ago, there was a bishop uh, 
who was an Arab uh, Anglican bishop. And he was visiting London and he was arrested at a men's room by the Metropolitan Police for solicitation. And this bishop before uh, the uh, incident took place was a fierce critic of a certain non-Muslim government in the Middle East. After his arrest, he was completely silent. He didn't say a word. George Carey got the charges thrown out. And when I started recovering the Anglican world 20 plus years ago, it was said that this was all set up by the Mossad to take out this bishop. And this bishop had politically damaging things that if the Arab world knew that he'd been arrested for solicitation in a men's room in London, his life, his career be over. And this is all public record. I'm not saying something that people don't already know. These sorts of things happen in the Anglican world where bishops are either compromised mm -hmm. either because of their past actions or because they actually believe in the compromises that they're putting forward. Um, maybe this sounds jaundiced. I, I don't mean it to be, but we need to be careful in, in idolizing or lionizing some of these leaders of our church who are, may not be the worthy people we think they are. Gavin, here in America, we have Trump as a reaction was made president because we had no good candidates to run against him. We had Hillary and some others. I noticed that there's a huge chance that Boris is going to be the next prime minister of England. And I thought, really? Isn't he like Trump? What's the latest over there, Gavin? Right, but Kevin, before I answer that, can I uh, tag on a postscript to what George was talking about in Hong Kong? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure at which point to interrupt you, but the internet's slow today, so I <laughs> waited till, <laughs> right till the end. The we thought you were frozen. It's just the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just wanted to say that one of the observations that I think has been quite helpful and, 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 and theologically non-contentious, <laughs> which after all the comments of last week may be useful, um, is that looking at the Christian church in Hong Kong as it struggles with the potential asphyxiating grip of Marxism from mainland China, it's paradoxical that as we fight this, a, a battle which is a prelude to the movement of Marxism in our culture, um, that we are not doing, we're not doing, first of all, more to support the Christians who are part of the Hong Kong uh, demonstrations of democracy, but also that we're not being more suspicious with our leaders in Europe who are signing up to the kind of ideological worldview that underlines underlies the whole Marxist experiment in China in that in that essentially given the steepness of the trajectory towards a totalitarian control of ideology um, we should be much more suspicious of the culture that the church is buying into in Europe than we are because we're heading straight for a Hong Kong China standoff ourselves we are going to be the protesting people singing hallelujah in the streets um, and and the, the the church leaders in in England at any rate are the people who are signing up to the progressive values of what is essentially a Marxist culture. So that that just as a small postscript to that, Boris. Well, <laughs> um, uh, Boris versus Gove. Uh, Gove. Uh -oh. Christian. Whereas Boris, Boris is just. Um, as people people say a walking ego on legs uh and in that sense people think that he's a bit like trump i think he's significantly less christian than donald trump which may cause us some trouble and um, boris is charming it's very hard to know whether he's a man of any substance or whether he's just uh, a an showman. antidote or well, a showman uh, yeah a showman yes yeah. yes i mean if he's got any integrity uh he could be the courageous man for the moment. And in that sense, he might have, there might be similarities with Trump. But to, to my mind, leaving aside Trump's personal moral failings, uh, which I have no interest in at all, Trump's great political significance was that he stopped the Hillary Obama culturally progressive steamroller. Mm. Well, we have a, a culturally progressive steamroller here too. And if Boris can be relied upon to stop that, it will buy us a bit more time, as you've been bought a bit more time. Um, however, we've absolutely no way of knowing whether or not he has any internal 
ideological integrity uh, and nor do we know whether or not he'll survive politically because it could be quite possible that um the pro the the, the pro european forces in the house of commons will do ever will, will sacrifice even the conservative government in order to stop him leaving without a deal so it's going to be very exciting in the, gavin, in the next few months gavin i um uh, on inter on uh social media we have a phenomenon in the united states called trump derangement syndrome yes <laughs> where i mean i even saw this in my own congregation where i had an adult woman who as a child had been molested by an a by a male authority figure uh so identified donald trump as a bully that she in essence withdrew from essentially life because she was so upset about donald trump she hates him so much um i'm not saying all criticism of donald trump is uh misdirected personal animus but i've been looking at some of these comments on the internet made by church leaders uh there was an article in the guardian by george uh, pitcher who's uh mm. is, a, is a pr man who became a priest very recently uh who were basically the level of vitriol against uh, boris johnson is on a Trump derangement syndrome. The establishment, the, the right-thinking people, really hate this man. Not that they disagree with him, not that they think he's a, a rube or a lout, or, uh, but that he's evil. Well, this, this is so interesting, George. One of the most interesting articles I read, sorry to use the word interesting twice, uh, George, that's, a, that's interesting. One of the most persuasive arguments I read was that Boris's danger is that he is a soft, a, a, a soft showman who just wants to be loved, who's very much in favor of um, other races and, and the gay agenda. In other words, he's enormously progressive, but he hates being not loved. Uh, and so the idea that he has anything to do with racism uh, or Hitler or fascism is so far detached from reality that, as you say, it can only be a phenomenon of some kind of dislocated projection syndrome. Um, because that's not where the danger comes from at all. And the idea that, you know, the pitcher could see that or that our, our, our esteemed Episcopal leaders can so associate him with those values is, is a terrible mistake on reality. And one of the really interesting questions is, why have we worked ourselves up as a society? Uh, into rages, which have very little to do with what people actually say with what they actually mean. It makes communication almost impossible. Uh, you may not know this, Gavin, but uh, every once in a while, somebody over in England is censoring you. Uh, you'll freeze up and one or two words is missing. And it only happens like once every five minutes, but it's cute when it does happen. And it hasn't happened so much that we have to retape it because the, the, the context is still there. But I want people to know that we're well aware of the censoring that's going on right now. I think... <laughs> I, if I can just jump in. Uh, 15 years ago, I uh, interviewed uh, Michael Gove for, the, for an article I was writing for the Jerusalem Post. And I had to tell that anyone with less charisma, personal, uh, it, 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 and I, I'm not saying he's a bad man, but he, you put him next to his, the rival for office, Boris Johnson, you do have a really clear, stark choice between a showman and a cipher. Uh, it's really quite funny. Well, my interesting take on all this is, Trump can be his worst enemy. Boris can be his worst enemy. Pfft. Justin Welby can be his own worst enemy, just by what they say sometimes in the press. You and Gavin are his well, worst yeah. we, we, enemy. Anglin and Script is the worst enemy for Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. But sometimes they'll just open their mouth. What were you thinking? Why did you say that? Why did you tweet that? Throw your Twitter account away unless you have somebody. It just, I sometimes have Trump and Boris derangement syndrome just by reading the tweets. And that's, you know, that's the way it is. We need to move into other topics. The topic du jour over in the Church of England seems to be whether or not we can be friends with the Methodist again and have them work within our liturgy and work within our Eucharist. Uh, can you bring us up to date on that, Gavin? 
Yes, uh, I, the, the, the facts and my views. I think my views are probably so idiosyncratic that perhaps I shouldn't express them uh, or, or we'll get Gavin derangement syndrome among some of our readers. <laughs> um, uh, but um, it's partly because I've become so enamoured of the whole history of Eucharistic miracles that I've begun to think that presidency at the Eucharist really matters uh, in terms of the Lord showing up. Putting all that to one side, uh, the Church of England is going to discuss at Synod whether or not, having failed to get the Methodists to agree to Episcopal ordination, it can just, as a matter of pragmatism, say, well, let's make an exception and let's license each other to preside at the Eucharist and never mind the theology of what might happen in the real presence, but let's just get on and share man, actually much more in particular woman power. Um, and so, uh, and then we'll sort we'll sort the theology out afterwards. Um, some people will welcome this as a way of pragmatically evangelizing the country. Uh, to other people, it will look like like the, the the failure of liberal Protestantism trying to pool its resources as they diminish ever so swiftly. Um, and I I I I, um, I can see the practical advantages of it. I I lament I lament the. Um, a wider understanding of, of, of Eucharistic history and Episcopal ordination. But George has views on that, I think. Yeah. The, uh, first, for our American readers, the British Methodist Church is not the United Methodist Church of the Correct. United States and Africa. Mm -hmm. So these are two different animals. And the British Methodist Church is very liberal, it's very small. It is like sort of the extreme left of the United Methodist Church in the USA. So this is not a stabilizing or reforming or even an evangelical leavening of the Church of England. This is taking the, the, the extreme left, adding some more allies to their ranks, and they share fairly common uh, anthropology about the world. Um, now, I will concede that historically we can look back to incidents in the Anglican history of when Huguenot pastors were expelled from France, they were received into the Church of England and in places like South Carolina and other parts of the world without the necessity of reordination. So there have been exceptions. This is not what we're talking about here. Yeah, those are temporary this, basis this, type things. This yeah. is looking, you know, one, you know, we're looking at one individual and uh, and case by case scenario. And there have always been these sort of little aberrations. Uh, and one off things throughout the history on most on many many issues what the Church of England is doing now is basically trying to say have we reached the point where we really are that the Methodists are strong their Methodist belief about uh, ordination and ecclesiology is stronger than our own internal mm -hmm. understanding of what ecclesiology is mm -hmm. such that we are the ones who are able to say well it doesn't matter anymore let's just make nice and uh, add a few more unemployable clergy to the uh, church rolls. Okay, last story. Yep. This We're going to finish up with this one. We've been talking about this now for six weeks, five weeks, six weeks, doesn't matter. It's been a long conversation. As far as I can tell, nobody in Nigeria knows what the prosperity gospel is. Is you know, I don't think they understand because I'm seeing some people defend and some people throw this uh, bishop elect under the bus mm. who, in their comments, clearly don't understand what is happening and what is meant by the prosperity gospel. Uh, are you seeing the same, George? I wouldn't say not all or none. I use these big proclamations all the time. What? The prosperity gospel is only about 10, 15 years old in Nigeria. And so Correct. we're seeing it we're seeing it among younger clergy or people who've been educated and who only have about 10 or 15, 20 years service. They've seen it work for other people and they're bringing it on board themselves. And so, but they know the prosperity gospel is wrong because their archbishops are telling them, you may not do this, you may not preach this, you may not teach this. Then they go ahead and teach it anyway. So what we're seeing in some quarters, not all quarters, in some quarters is an ignorance uh, based on the lack of theological rigor. There are theological professors in Nigeria teaching it today, 
who have been in correspondence with me saying you are Matt Kennedy's critique is absolutely spot on. But I am fighting an uphill battle against these people who are who are responding to me uh, by saying, well, didn't Jesus said all power will be given unto you? And therefore, that means I can do X, Y, Z. Uh, you know, the case at point, um, the Church of Nigeria asked Matt Kennedy, a priest of the ACNA, a senior clergyman, by the way, uh, to put together, memorialize, meaning write it down, a complaint about Dr. Augustine Onigbe for preaching false doctrine. And Matt did so. And he and this false doctrine was most recently stated on Pentecost Sunday. Now the fear is that the nouns that are describing this, people will say, oh yes, that's wrong. But when they actually look at the examples, they say, well, I've been hearing this in church for a while. I don't see this as wrong. So it's a lack of, um, it's, the, it's, the sl it's the creeping in of a foreign heresy into the church that is rot rotting and sapping it with, from within. And it's a very disheartening process to see. It's, it's, how we ha it's, it's how the gay agenda flourished in the United States. Yeah, it wasn't nice because you had Jack Spong or some bishop here or there promoting it, but it started on the small local level as the culture changed, as the world changed, people wanted to be nice. They, they didn't address things through a theological lens, but through an emotional lens. And the same process that led to the Episcopal Church and the Church of England where it stands today is underway in the Church of Nigeria. Uh, we have reports from the recent Bernard Mazeki Festival in the Diocese of Harare. That's the big festival for the Central African Church. People come from all across Central Africa to worship at the shrine. The bishops there had to shut down some prosperity and deliverance preachers, their own clergy, who are talking about you know, heal, you know, raising the dead and unstopping stopped ears and all this and that at the festivals. Um, this, this is a problem. I, I agree, and I, I don't think it's a problem of three streams. I don't think it's a problem of uh, you know of cessationalists and stuff like that. I think it's just a problem with the uniqueness and desire uh, to be influenced by the prosperity gospel, to find out that God only wants money and good and healing for you, when the reality is, if you really want to impress God, suffer. Hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's not the, the wealth. And there, there's an old Jewish context. It, you ask a, a, an Old Testament Jew, how do you know God loves you? I'm rich. I have a great big family, I own lots of land, I'm a leader in the community. In the New Testament, knowing God loves you is a little different, and uh, um, you are blessed when you are suffering. Strange, strange dichotomy. Guys, I want to thank you for helping on the show. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gary Nashenden, and, and I hope it hasn't been too much suffering to listen to episode 511 of Anglican Unscripted. And if you have Anglican Unscripted derangement syndrome, good for you. <laughs> <laughs>